This has been one of the wildest election cycles in recent history. It appears shots have apparently been fired and Donald Trump has been injured. So I've decided the best way forward is to pass the torch to a new generation. Vice President Kamala Harris has secured the Democratic nomination for president, becoming the first woman of color at the top of a major party ticket. Welcome to Disrupted. I'm Kalila Brown-Dean. This hour, we're looking at how recent news could shape this year's presidential election. From President Joe Biden's decision to step aside, to Donald Trump's vice presidential pick, and now Vice President Kamala Harris's vice presidential selection. This interview was recorded before Vice President Harris announced that Minnesota Governor Tim Walz would be her running mate. Later, we'll hear about an organization that's supporting Black women in politics. Up first is journalist Jamila King. She'll give her take on the 2024 election. King is editorial director for Mother Jones. President Joe Biden's decision not to seek re-election was unprecedented. It is the closest to election day that a president has ever made such a decision. And it also paved the way for a new round of historic first. Vice President Kamala Harris will become the first black woman and the first South Asian person to be nominated by a major party for president. Ask Jamila how Vice President Harris will navigate these historic firsts and the challenges that may come. As much as um, this is a new kind of unprecedented frontier for the American public and for our political system, Kamala Harris has built her career off of being the first. So she was go- going back to her time as district attorney of San Francisco. She's always sort of been the first black woman, the first woman, the first South Asian woman into a space. She has this quote that's kind of circulating again, especially on TikTok, which is essentially you can open the door for someone and let other people through behind you, or you can close it shut and expect those people to sort of pound it down. You know, I think that she is, and at least based on my reporting, not a sentimental person, but I think what seems to be different this time around than in her previous campaign for president in 2020 is that she is leaning into the historic nature of her candidacy a bit more. Um, you know, I, I think that this is really important and powerful for a lot of people. And I think you see that in all of the excitement. That's something that I think a lot of people are kind of taken aback by even supporters, is just how much excitement there is in this first week. Uh, This is excitement that I don't think you've seen since 2007, 2008 with Barack Obama in terms of really energizing the Democratic base. Um, You know, she's tackling tough issues. I think she gave a a statement and a short speech on uh, the war on Gaza. And, you know, she did, the messaging wasn't super different from the Biden administration's, but it was, the tone was different. It was a little bit more welcoming to folks who are really concerned with the genocide in Gaza and what's happening. And so being a first is really great. But I think, you know, we both have a lived lived experience that it can be very lonely. It helps to kind of build the infrastructure and the sort of uh, political apparatus so that you can make sure that you are the first, but you are not the last. Voters are fickle. Our attention is fleeting. So there's a lot of enthusiasm right now. And people are saying, well, when do we get to talk about or critique the record? And you wrote back in 2021 about some of the criticism that Vice President Harris was receiving from Black women activists who wanted to dig into those policies and those concerns. How do those criticisms or concerns that people had in 2021, how do they play out today in 2024? In 2020, what you saw in the Kamala Harris campaign was a candidate who wasn't quite able to map out a platform. And the reason she wasn't able to do that was because the context, um, not to use the coconut tree (laughs) analogy, but the context around her had changed. So she has, you know, at least up until the past decade or so, spent the majority of her life of her professional career in law enforcement. Right. And, uh, you know, I think that it's important to note that she was a prosecutor before the term progressive prosecutor existed. I don't think that she really aligns well and her record aligns well with being a progressive prosecutor. But she was a black prosecutor who was prosecuting, you know, largely sex crimes against children, 
in the 1990s. And those of us who grew up in inner cities in the 1980s and 1990s know how hectic that time was, right? And when I say hectic, I mean that, you know, you had a lot of drug violence, you had um, a lot of disinvestment in Black communities. And so just the tenor of the conversation around policing was very, very different. And by the time you got to 2020, you saw, obviously, after the murder of George Floyd, you saw people really rethinking fundamentally how our system operates. And what was interesting about that as it relates to Kamala Harris is that she's never been someone who thinks outside of the system. She's very much a what can you do from inside the house type of person. Um, and so, I, you know, I think that this year in 2024, it is a different context, right? I, I, I think that for various reasons, you see calls to defund the police not as prominent or at least being met with a lot more organized conservative backlash. And, you know, I think that might sort of work a little bit in her favor. But, you know, I think what you've already seen on the campaign trail is that her case is going to be very simple to the American people. And it's going to be, I am well positioned to prosecute criminals like Donald Trump because I've done it all my life. You know, one of the concerns I have we have been inundated with memes, right? It's like the memification of American politics. One of the memes that I've been saying is the prosecutor versus the felon. And that's the framing of, you know, the the officer versus the criminal. And I think that resonates with a particular demographic. But I'm also concerned, Jamila, that it alienates many of the very voters and constituents who have concerns about her record as a prosecutor, whether those concerns are accurate or not. But it is built on this concern of can there be a trust and fairness with all of the concerns that people have about the justice system in the U.S.? Am I overstating that concern or does it it raise something for you as well of how that framing fits into that longer narrative of her record when it comes to justice? I don't think you're overstating it at all. I mean, I'll just speak from personal experience. I know people with criminal convictions who are good people, who are probably more trustworthy than a lot of other people. So, you know, I think that messaging is particularly tricky in Black communities that have been over-policed, that have been imprisoned, incarcerated for generations. I think that's going to be a really, really tough line for her to walk. And so I think, you know, maybe parsing that a little bit with sort of the impunity that we see a lot of wealthy white folks get when they are convicted of criminal convictions, right? Like creating a level playing field. But I do think this idea of good and bad and, you know, good and evil or (laughs) these dichotomies, whenever we get into the, the dichotomies that are really black and white, I think they become dangerous. But that, I think, messaging is really laser pointed to a particular demographic of voter, a white voter who is undecided in a swing state. And, you know, I, I think that we've seen from Kamala Harris's time in the vice president, she, vice presidency that she is willing to make those political concessions. Um, you know, we saw that, for instance, when she was tasked with the very, very tough assignment of investigating the root causes of immigration And we saw her giving a press conference in Guatemala where she said again and again, do not come to, you know, potential migrants. That moment was pretty shocking for a lot of people who followed her career because she is, after all, the child of immigrants. And immigration has been an important part of her political identity and her political platform. But, you know, I think it's safe to say that that was a moment where she made a very calculated political decision to really fall in line with the Biden team and have them sort of, you know, trust her. Um, And maybe I think there's an argument to be made that she's now reaping the benefits of that of that, you know, calculation. But it's nonetheless really, really difficult to stomach and it's difficult to see. So I think as much as we are excited about her candidacy and excited about her being the first, I think it's important to remember that like we are not the, the goal is not to get someone into office who we idolize without criticism or without complaint, right? Like our our job as people who are active in this country and this democracy is to question power, is to hold power to account. And, you know, in this election, I think it's really who is 
the best opponent you want in the White House? One of the other things that people are focusing on is who will be the vice president's running mate, right? I'm going to be honest with you. I never really knew what Dick Cheney did as VP other than go hunting. I never really knew what Dan Quayle did when he was a vice president other than talk about, you know, like going to speak to kids. No one really knew what Al Gore did as vice president aside from his personal passion projects around the climate. Really important work. And what I keep hearing with this vice presidential discussion is, well, she needs a really strong running mate to help shore up on particular issues. And people don't really know what her record was as vice president to Joe Biden. So that's why this choice is so clear. Is it really about the policy perspective of the vice presidential person? Or is it more about can that running mate speak to a base who may be unwilling or uncertain about the top of the ticket, and then this helps flesh that out. What's really driving all of the attention to who the running mate will be? There are two things at play. So yes, you want someone in the vice presidency as a candidate who can speak to the base that is uncertain about Kamala Harris's record or identity or what have you. You also want someone who's a little comfortable maneuvering the power of Washington, D.C., I say that because it's only the past few years, really, maybe 10 years, that we've kind of gotten away from this idea that the vice president is someone who has a lot of experience in the Senate or on Capitol Hill and is the person who can help, who is typically a a presidential, somewhat like outsider to D.C., maneuver things and get legislation passed. That would be really important for Kamala Harris, just because even though she's been vice president and even though she was in the Senate before that, she was only in the Senate for a really short time. And I think you see this play out by the fact that even though she's been in elected office for, you know, almost more than 20 years, um, the American people don't really know who she is. She's still a bit of a mystery. Let's talk about J.D. Vance, because when you laid out what a vice presidential running mate is supposed to do or could do, I think that was the expectation that a lot of people had about J.D. Vance. He will appeal to a segment of the American population that Trump, not that he hasn't connected with, but may not be able to mobilize in it in that particular way. He brings having a veteran status. He has some experience in Congress, even if it's not much But that doesn't seem like it has translated into the kind of energizing force that many people thought that his announcement would make at the time of the convention. How do you think that choice of J.D. Vance as running mate to Donald Trump, how do you see that playing out, given those kinds of things that you pointed to before? A lot of the excitement about J.D. Vance is centered around him being a young white man. And the idea is that he will appeal to these young white men who are left out of society and who want to be engaged with something bigger than themselves. And that doesn't seem to quite be holding up. And the place that I see it playing out is uh, YouTube. So I'm a big sports person. And, you know, on YouTube, you see a lot of these like creators who are, who really struggle with describing women and and feminism and so you've seen the rise of the WNBA for instance and they don't really know how to talk about that and I think if anything you're seeing JD Vance sort of reveal himself as this caricature of kind of the clueless white boy right and and that's not that's there's a like we all kind of know that guy and we don't we don't trust that guy right so in some ways it's a numbers game in some ways it is about can the Kamala Harris campaign get out voters who relate to her, the single women, the people of color, the young people, the women of color? Um, Can she activate them in a way that they are going to come out in numbers that they wouldn't have if Joe Biden was still at the top of the ticket? And then, you know, I think you're going to see a lot of excitement for whoever's chosen. But I also think that, you know, with with J.D. Vance, I don't know that he's established himself as this care, like this, this really charismatic figure. It's been really interesting to see him stumble in the ways that he has. And I think some you might even say that there's a little bit of trepidation in the Trump camp because he's he's not galvanizing 
the new kind of uncertain base that people hoped that he would have. I think some of the calculus there was that J.D. Vance for a pretty long time was a very loud critic of Donald Trump and sort of represented this idea that the Republican Party, you know, at its core was something different than what Trump represented. And so this, I think, was a move on the Trump campaign's part to co-opt that and to say, look, I can listen to criticism. It doesn't bother me as much. And actually, you know, we want to unite the Republican Party. So far, I don't think you've seen that. Um, And J.D. Vance has so far not been a good ambassador for Trump's values. Coming up, more from journalist Jamila King. She'll discuss the upcoming Democratic National Convention. I'm actually excited now. You know, for a long time, I was like, this is such a strategic misstep. And now I'm a little bit more hopeful. And later, a conversation about how Black women are shaping politics. This is Disrupted. Stay with us. Welcome back to Disrupted. I'm Kalila Brown-Dean. This hour, we're unpacking some of the biggest stories in U.S. politics, from the upcoming Democratic National Convention to down-ballot races happening in states across the country. We've been talking with Jamila King, editorial director for Mother Jones. During our conversation, I mentioned a TikTok creator named Francesca Ramsey. Francesca's videos often include a song that says, I never thought the leopards would eat my face. Me, 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 me. I never thought the leopards would eat my face. No, I never thought the leopards would eat my face. Well, I'm the moral authority, so the rules, they don't apply to me. No, I never thought the leopards would eat my face. The song refers to people who are adversely affected by rhetoric or policy that's supported by their party. A recent example came to light when racist comments were made targeting Usha Vance. She's the wife of the Republican vice presidential nominee, J.D. Vance. Ask Jamila about these types of backlashes. I think they're saying the quiet parts out loud um, for so long the Republican Party has tried to rebrand its racism as, you know, states' rights or rebrand its misogyny as, you know, home values. I'll say that as somebody who grew up in a working class community, women are the backbone of, of any working class family, right? And so I think it's really underestimating how important working women are. And we're not just talking about like educated women who've chosen not to have children, I mean, women who have it, you know, maybe gone to college, maybe didn't even finish high school, who are nonetheless hardworking and taking care of their kids and making it work. And, you know, I think it's also interesting to think about the fact that the majority of, of folks who get abortions are folks who already have kids, right? They're making an economic decision. They're making, a, it's all about bodily autonomy, obviously, but they are, it's at the heart of it. It's in usually an economic or a health decision, right? So I think that it's really, really going to be interesting to see how class and and specifically working class folks are responding or not responding to the Trump ticket, because I think it's so far been a really big miscalculation that working women want to go back to a time when they didn't have to leave the home. I mean, a lot of those homes were abusive, right? Like, it's really important that women, working women especially, have access to their own finances, have financial freedom, have the ability to leave a relationship that isn't working for them, have the ability to have their own bodily autonomy, financial autonomy. And I think those are some things that are getting lost in the conversation that J.D. Vance is trying to propose, right? And I think that's where the really sneaking feeling that he's, you know, inauthentic is coming from because it doesn't really align with what people see and have lived through and and have experienced in their own lives and their own families. 
Let's talk about a big event that's coming up very soon. That is the Democratic National Convention. Many of us watched the Republican National Convention to see how the story would be told, but also who the storytellers would be. And so we saw somewhat of a different face for the Republican Party on that main stage. Democrats are preparing for their convention in Chicago. There's a lot of history around that, the DNC convention, particularly in Chicago. What are you paying attention to or what should we be paying attention to with this convention coming up very soon in Chicago? Chicago has a really rich history, particularly modern history of organizing in Black communities. So I think it's going to be really interesting to see if and how the DNC incorporates that, what sorts of bridges have been built to a lot of the folks who have been working to end gun violence on Chicago streets, for instance. There are like really, really important historical parallels, but also modern parallels. Moving forward, it's going to be interesting to see how they, how the DNC tells the history of 1968. You can and should expect a lot of protesters to show up to the DNC, you know, on a host of issues because the Kamala Harris ticket is is sort of tasked with uniting a lot of various factions of the Democratic Party. You see a lot of folks who are really critical of the Democratic response to the war on Gaza. You see a lot of folks, like we talked about earlier in this conversation, who are critical about policing and Kamala Harris's record as a prosecutor. You're going to see a lot of folks come out. And I think how the Democratic Party apparatus responds to that is going to be really, really key in making sure that things go smoothly, but also in like telling the narrative of what this party can be, right? So if all of these decades later, we've learned anything, it's that, you know, the party is stronger when it represents its fiercest critics in some ways. And so, you know, I think that's something interesting to watch out for. Um, Brandon Johnson, who is a uh, the Black mayor of Chicago, who is well-known and well-respected in organizing communities. It'll be really important to see how he and his administration, you know, roll out the welcome mat, who they roll it out for. So, you know, I'm I'm actually excited now about this. You know, for a long time, I was like, this is such a strategic misstep that they're going to have a convention in a city that is known for being host to its worst, you know, PR disaster of a convention in 1968. And now I'm a little bit more hopeful. I'm a little bit more hopeful that it at least won't be the violent spectacle that it was all those years ago in 1968. There's a different spectacle of violence that concerns me. We are a few weeks past an attempted assassination on former President Trump. There's a lot of unrest, not just in the U.S., but globally, of people's discontent in many different ways. And now we're bringing people together for a convention, which, as you said, will be charged in many different ways. So this convention will unfold against the backdrop of that specter of how violence has been used. And when I say violence, I want to be clear. I'm not just talking about how people respond to politicians or elected leaders. I'm also mentioning the ways that violence is has been used against people who are protesting or against people who are speaking up. So that, that broad notion of what violence, state-sanctioned violence, as well as individual acts, matter. How do you think that that will sort of stay in people's mind in terms of the context? You know, I think people may be more sensitive to how people are responding to these protests, but also thinking about how do we protect the people who are organizing and coming together, affirming their rights and keeping people safe? You know, I think that you saw sort of a testing ground during the George Floyd protest, which you know, by and large, I was in New York City and I saw several and I think that they were really important sort of staging grounds for organizers and for folks to kind of perfect their organizing tactics, keeping people safe, both in a sort of health sense, but also in the public safety sense, like working with the police or trying to to work with the police to make sure that they don't respond in a, an aggressively violent way. 
I also think that you ha- can take a look at the recent protests around Gaza. You know, I think that those are interesting and also potential landmines for Kamala Harris because, you know, for instance, Benjamin Netanyahu, the prime minister of Israel, was in Washington, D.C. this week, and there were major protests outside where he was speaking, and Kamala Harris's campaign came out and was very critical of those protests. And I know a lot of people personally who are like, oh, okay, I'm, I'm clocking that, I'm keeping that, <laughs> you know, that criticism in my back pocket. And so I, I think the point of protest is to showcase the strength of a vocal section of people who are committed to fighting for what they believe in, committed to coming together to have their collective voice known and heard by the powers that be. And so I think it's going to be really important for the Democratic Party to listen. I think this idea that you can control it is a false one. And I think you you saw that in 1968, right? And I think so much of Kamala Harris's platform so far has been you know, we will not be governed by fear. And I think that that has to also be true internally for her campaign and for the Democratic Party. You cannot be governed by fear as it relates to your own constituencies rising up and telling you very loudly what they are for and what they are against. I wonder for you, Jamila, as a journalist who is in the trenches of this daily, how do you not get overwhelmed by it all. How how do you hold this space for, yes, this is my job, but I'm a human being who has to protect my peace. How do you hold those two things together? That is a great question. You know, I have been thinking about this a lot because in my personal life, and this is part of what's driving me, you know, I've been having a lot of tough conversations with family members and <laughs> with close friends who who think very differently than I do, um, who are, you know, supporters of candidates who I may not be supportive of. And I think the most important thing there for me is to have compassion and to listen, right? And I think that's that's very underrated. But, you know, in terms of what I do and my practices for staying sane, um, this week has not been a good example of that. But it's important for me to put my phone down. It's important for me to, you know, last night I let my phone die. Um, I let the battery run totally out, which was nice. And I think it's important to, you know, move my body. I think that keeps me healthy. And, you know, I think as much as um, this is a matter of so many people's lives, when you talk about longevity, you have to think about the things that are actually going to give you that longevity, whether it's how you're taking care of yourself personally, your health, um, the communities that you're sustaining, the families that you're building, blood or chosen. You know, those are those are some of the things. But I think ultimately listening and um, not not taking too much to heart, I think, is 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 really important. And also knowing when you have to turn off, you know, knowing when this this new like we are living in unprecedented times, both politically and technologically. Never before has it been so easy for us to be inundated with so much information. And so we're just now kind of as a human species learning how to regulate that. There's a lot happening. There's a lot that is drawing on or gnawing at our attention in this election. A lot of people are so focused at the top of the ticket that they are not talking about the sort of everyday lived realities and experiences that you're mentioning, not just in terms of the elections that are happening at local and state level, but the people who after the day after the election, regardless of whatever outcomes across those spaces, have to be whole, deserve to be healthy and deserve to know that they have worth Is there a particular topic or theme that as we think about these next few months, again, not just up to the election, that you at Mother Jones are saying, we want to make sure that this is in the air of consideration for people? Yeah, I mean, so my work since I've gotten to Mother Jones um, has been focused around looking at how Black women engage with political power. And that doesn't just mean at the top of the ticket. It also means that I've you know been able to profile housing activists um, who are single moms who are, you know, working to ensure the right to a livable home in some of the nation's most expensive cities. Um, I think it's really important to take a look at the energy that's surrounding us, right? 
the political energy up and down, not just the the ticket, but in the community, right? We're talking about away from the ballot box. Like, what are the forces? Who are the people who are making sure that people are fed, who are making sure that people are housed, who are making sure that people are safe? And so I think that'll be really, really important moving forward. And that's something that I'm going to continue to look at in my work. Also making sure that I am I am also including regular voices in my work, not just the privileged people who have access to a podcast or or whatever. Like I want to make sure that I'm talking to ordinary people who are having these really tough conversations on an interpersonal level, because I think those are the stories that matter. Well, we look forward to reading your stories and even more so being in community with those voices as well. Jamila King is editorial director at Mother Jones. Thank you so much. Thank you. Coming up, Glenda C. Carr of Higher Heights for America talks about how Black women are organizing to impact elections. Black women's organizing has been the modern day architects of this democracy for centuries. This is Disrupted. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Disrupted. I'm Kalila Brown-Dean. Today, we are discussing the 2024 election and how recent developments could shape that race. Vice President Kamala Harris's campaign is already showing us the power of Black women in U.S. politics. Shortly after President Joe Biden ended his candidacy, a group called Win with Black Women organized a Zoom call. That one call attracted more than 40,000 participants and raised more than $1.5 million. To tell us more about how Black women are shaping this election, I'm joined now by Glenda C. Carr. She's president and CEO of Higher Heights for America. Glenda, it's great to have you back on Disrupted. Great to be on. You are a voice that we have leaned on frequently on this show to talk about the issues of the day, especially for Black women. Remind some of our newer listeners about the purpose and vision of Higher Heights. So Higher Heights certainly was built for this moment. Almost 12 years ago, I sat in a Brooklyn cafe where I was living um, with a good friend, Kimberly Peeler Allen. We both worked in New York politics and national politics, uh, and it was right after the midterm elections. Uh, we often were in rooms that were mostly white and mostly male. We didn't have the language that day, but we wrote the words higher heights down. We were looking for a space that was uniquely kind of designed for us to be informed, engaged, and to take action, centering Black women's voices, votes, and leadership. And so we uh, set out to build the political home for Black women. We help Black women to vote, run, win, and lead on the national level. And over the last 12 years, we have helped to you know, move the number of Black women serving in as mayors. In 2014, there was just one. There's now nine Black women serving as mayors of top 100 cities. In 2014, there were only 18 Black women serving uh, in Congress. There are now 31. In 2014, there was just 241 Black women serving in state legislatures across this country. We now have over 340. And something that I think is uh, important to note from a Connecticut lens is there were only just two Black women serving in statewide executive office. And now we have over five. Secretary of the State Stephanie Thomas is counted in those numbers. There will be people who will listen to those numbers you just mentioned in terms of those increases. And the question will immediately become how? How is it that your organization has been able to mobilize and how that will fit into this moment? What does this moment mean for Higher Heights and the work that you've been doing since your founding? So Black women um, have been political leaders since a sojourner truth, right? You know, for you to be uh, an academic and, and spend much of your, your work steeped in history, Black women's organizing has been the modern day architects of this democracy for centuries. Oftentimes, organizing our house, our block, our church, our sorority, and our union have been the margins of wins for elections, 
in the cycle, but we hadn't seen uh, that translate into, frankly, policies that center Black women, um, our communities in this nation. Um, but it also didn't translate into elected leadership. Over the last 10 years, with the work of organizations across this country, including Higher Heights, we've created an environment for Black men to truly step into our next phase of political leadership. It is not that we have not been leading. Right. Uh, Oftentimes our leaderships have not been invested in. Talked to a reporter recently and was like, well, is the country ready for a woman president and particularly a woman of color and black woman? And I state the world has been ready. In fact, our allies across this country have elected women presidents for decades. This moment in our country history, I do think, you know, we are living in politically toxic and racially divisive times. And so I do think the season for change is ripe for an ability to create a reflective democracy. Kamala Harris, in particular, is uniquely positioned. Here is a woman who ran and won and governed on every level, and Higher Heights has been with her along that journey. She has been a local elected. She was statewide executive um, elected as the attorney general of um, California. She was a, a elected on the federal level and governed as a legislator in the U.S. Senate. And she is just steps away from the Oval Office. I think the country is looking for that type of leadership. And in this moment, her leadership plus the energy that has been created around her, I think, means that America is positioned to make history. But, you know, it's history for our country, not history for this globe. That excitement that's happening, some people are surprised by it, right? Especially those who ask the question, is the country ready for having a woman of color, a Black woman, a South Asian woman at the top of the ticket? And every time I hear that, Glenda, I think about how that has been used to discourage Black women from voting, from running, from being able to be viewed as leaders. There's this question of electability. Can Black women raise the money that is necessary to do this? And within 24 hours of the announcement that President Biden would not seek a second term, you had over 44,000 Black women come together to raise money to say, we will support this. That also doesn't happen overnight. It's organizations like yours that has been meeting for the last four or five years, bringing women together, the Sunday brunches you do, to say, create a foundation and a network so that that question of electability can no longer be valid. What is the impact that Black women in particular will have on this election? And what do you think that says about the future of your organization? That first Sunday... I was at, it's what, you know, many people, but particularly Black women do on a Sunday. I went to church with my brother. I was at brunch and I got a text from a reporter who was like, he's out. It's like, what? Who's out? Thinking like, who's outside? And then literally in three tweets, right, talking about how we're organizing in this election, there were tweets that made this announcement, right? A tweet that the president was not going to seek re-election, a tweet that he was endorsing his vice president uh, and a tweet from the vice president said that she was intending to seek, you know, was going to announce her candidacy. That then created this organic ability for people to be, you know, excited on their social feeds. But the power of Black women is is our relational organizing, right? That call with When Black Black Women has been happening every Sunday for four years. It was the container to hold the energy of everyday Black women. You know, I got it from my friends from Connecticut. I got my, I have my sorority thread from Connecticut. I have my church girls thread. I have my family thread. I had a church mother text the information to get on a call, like I said, that I've known that's been happening for four years, but now the country knew. and, And that then sparked Every single, when you talk about identity politics, like people use identity politics as a negative, right? Oftentimes in last week showed the power of identity politics. People organize their own networks. The, the white dudes got the white dudes, the white women got the white women, the black women gathered. And to be clear, black, white, black women gathered to do four things. We were like, you're not going to take, we're going to be joyous in this moment, but then we're going to prepare to be, to organize, mobilize, and to fight. We are in a moment and a context, Glenda, where people are attacking Black organizations, institutions, 
and spaces, whether it is Black women venture capitalists who want to create investments or it is institutions like colleges and universities, sororities, whatever it is, there is this attack on that. A lot of that attack for some people was highlighted when the former president spoke at the National Association of Black Journalists. My personal response was, why are people surprised? We have seen this continuing attack on Black women, particularly Black women journalists, but also candidates and opponents. In this moment, in this space, how do you hold space for the joy that you feel and also some of the angst that people are feeling of having to constantly be on the defensive mode to be in these spaces? How do you hold space for both? Good question. You know, we've been working towards this for many years. It is also, I, you know, have the privilege to actually personally know the vice president. And so I traveled with her on her first trip to Africa last year. And when we walked into a room, she was hosting a reception. She had a delegation of 50 Black leaders that went with her. And to see how she was received, you know, by the people of Ghana and Tanzania, the two countries she attended, you could even see that she stood a little taller. Here's a woman that wakes up every day in the spirit of a book that I love by Angie Thomas called The Hate You Give. She wakes up and has to feel the hate the world gives her. And not because, you know, let's be clear, good political discourse is good for for our democracy in this country. I have no problem with us and I'm having to have a discussion about policy. The problem with the former president and the way that he and his campaign has approached this election and frankly 2016 is is centered in hate um, and mis and disinformation. And so for me to be on the continent, which was the first time um, I had traveled to Africa and to see her step on the global stage, um, not for the first time, but as you know, she'd made many trips around the globe. And that is the, the Kamala Harris I saw when she spoke at her first campaign. The reason why people are gravitating to her is what we've said when we supported her when she ran for U.S. Senate. Um, Maya Angelou once said, I come as one and I stand as 10,000. Her multiple identities, people see themselves in her. She is a woman. She's a woman of color. She's a woman. She identifies as a Black woman and a South Asian woman, which you can have multiple identities. She's a member of a, a sorority, right? So a member of our beloved historically Black Greek letter organization. But there's women across this country of all races and ethnicity who belong to sororities. Uh, she went to a historically Black college. She's an attorney. She has all these identities that literally are coming together to, to give the energy for her to soar. And so I celebrate the excitement of that. I celebrate it as a continuation of a Shirley Chisholm 52 years ago um, would, be, have, would have been preparing for, to go to the Democratic National Convention like Kamala Harris. Um, but I also recognize the rhetoric is going to continue uh, to increase. Our democracy is not safe. The women in the particularly the black women in this democracy are not safe. And so I appeal to those listening, right, that we all have a role to play. See something and say something. We all have powerful networks. So, you know, be safe in these social media tweets. But question have have productive conversations with your family, friends, and allies about how we are going to create this democracy that we actually can be proud of. I found myself. Shirley Chisholm once said, I have faith in America. And if I was at my house, you would would see the quote in my background. And I struggled with that for many years now. And I always go, well, here's a woman who, you know, ran and governed in the 1960s when it was not the the greatest space for Black people and for her to say that. And so it inspires me to believe. And so what brings me joy is that people are starting to believe in the possibilities of Black women's leadership in more of a broad sense, but more importantly, believing in the possibilities that we can create, that we can believe in the possibilities um, that we will create a democracy and a platform that we can use to move this country forward. As we round out our conversation, what should we be looking at the local and state level in terms of the priorities for higher heights, but for all of us as those who are politically interested, yeah, what should we be looking yeah. at there? I want, and I think you would agree, Black women want what our neighbors want. I live in a, in a fairly diverse community in Connecticut. We want economically thriving, educated, healthy, and safe communities. And I don't think that is a partisan uh, wish for 
our community. We need to determine and be informed about who are the leaders that that will take the interest of all Americans, all residents of the nutmeg state, and to set policies forth that will do that. And so there's all this energy and talk about the top of the ticket. Uh, and certainly that will be part of our work. But there are, you know, every member of the U.S. House of Representatives is up for re-election. You know, half of the U.S. Senate is up in seeking re-election in our state houses and our local, you know, local governments all have elections. And so one, don't let the top of the ticket, you know, take your eyes off of local governance and that. And when you get to that voting booth or if you mail it in the office, don't just stop at the top of the ticket. As it relates for higher heights, Connecticut has a, you know, a black woman in the delegation in Congress who is up for a, a tough re-election. And so we're trying to introduce, you know, not only Connecticut to a broader, a broader list of Black women who are running and governing like a Johanna Hayes, um, but there's just some interesting races of Black women and women that are running across this country. And so Higher Heights will be your go-to resource to learn more about the Black women that are running, like the former, you know, or running for re-election or running for office. There's a Black woman seeking election for Congress in, in Oregon, which this notion is that black women and black candidates can only rep, you know, only represent black constituencies. Black women, you know, are primed to, to, to lead like white men across this country. We don't question white men, you know, representing constituencies that don't look like, like them. And so we will be your go-to place to learn about black women that are running for office, but more importantly, your go-to place around preparing to vote, but more importantly, preparing for you to organize your network to vote. And more importantly, we are going to be your go-to place for really just great commentary that is insightful, uh, sassy at times, and fun at times. And so our Sunday brunch series will be your place to hear from voices that we don't hear, like including yours. And we're excited that you have um, joined our, you know, Black Malik Spin Room and and our Sunday brunches because there are just brilliant academic minds, um, writers, artists, um, activists that many of us don't know. And I think your show does a great job at highlighting that. So thank you for including my voice uh, in the show. And so onward, a friend of mine said last week, we can do anything for 100 days. And so we're less than 100 days. And literally, for those who are looking to move this country to higher heights, it is every single one of us um, will have a role to play um, to ensure that our voices, votes, and leadership transcend in this uh, election cycle in a way that it has never done before. Glenda C. Carr is president and CEO of Higher Heights for America. Glenda, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Disrupted is produced by Kevin Chang Barnum, Wayne Edwards, Robin Doyan Aiken, Meg Dalton, and Katie Tularski. You can listen to all the previous episodes of Disrupted by finding us wherever you get your podcasts. And a special note here for our listeners. We recently said goodbye to Katie Tularski. Katie is Senior Director of Storytelling and Radio Programming here at Connecticut Public. For me personally, Katie was more than just my producer. She was my dear friend. She is the one who first booked me as a guest on The Wheelhouse. And Katie was the one who pushed me and pushed us to move Disrupted from an idea to the show it is today. Thank you, Katie, for your friendship, for your vision, for your deep commitment to journalism and ethics and to the power of public media. We will miss Katie tremendously, but I am so proud and looking forward to her next steps. Thank you, Katie. I'm Kalila Brown-Dean. Thanks for listening.